And, <clears throat> and let me once again welcome everybody officially to today's online event, Frontiers of Conservation Finance. This event is sponsored by the Conservation Finance Forum and the Government Innovators Network. And I'd like to pass things over to today's moderator, Jim Levitt, who is the director of the Program on Conservation Innovation at Harvard Forest. Good morning, everyone. It is, uh, it is great to see so many uh, familiar names and uh, quite a few new names on the attendees list today. Uh, we are in Cambridge, Massachusetts at the Kennedy School of Government um, with Jim Cooney, who is helping us technically, uh, Lizzie Reardon, who has provided wonderful research assistant for this show, Bill Mumaw from Tufts University, who I will introduce in just a minute, and myself. Don Hay is joining us by telephone from Chicago. And you are all spread out from uh, Minnesota and North Dakota to Colorado to Virginia. And uh, I believe we're going to have guests from as far away as uh, India and Indonesia today. So it's an international audience. You're mostly practitioners. And I'm delighted that you're here to uh, hear two presentations and then ask good questions about a topic of emerging interest in the field of conservation, particularly in the field of conservation finance, that is ecosystem services. Uh, we have, as is usual on this internet broadcast, a speaker who is familiar with uh, an example in the United States, and a second speaker who is familiar with uh, the example internationally. Our first uh, guest today will be the international speaker. Uh, his name is Bill Muma. He should be familiar to many of you. Uh, Bill is a professor at the Fletcher School um, at Tufts University and is a co-recipient with uh, several hundred or even thousand other co-authors of the IPCC report uh, on global climate change uh, along with Al Gore. He is uh, a distinguished scholar who has um, been on the staff in the United States Senate who has run the environmental studies program at Williams College and has been at Tufts now uh, directing their climate change initiative uh, for more than a decade. Um, I will stop with the, the uh, introduction of Bill from his resume, which you see in front of you, and uh, ask Bill, uh, how did you uh, become reengaged with uh, the with the topic of financing forest um, sustainability and conservation. Well, as you as you mentioned, uh, back in the 70s with the reauthorization of the um, um, Multiple Use Sustained Yield Act of 1976, I was working as a staff member and uh, uh, for a senator who was very engaged in those uh, uh, negotiations. That was kind of my first formal connection to uh, to forests. Um, but um, over the years, I've worked, uh, past 20 years, I actually worked on climate change. And, and it, it's always struck me if you, you know, uh, even a cursory glance at the carbon cycle, you realize that forests are just such an in inherently important part of what's going on that to um, uh, the, 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 the mistaken um, uh, decision made in the year 2000 by the negotiators to really leave forests out of the uh, Kyoto Protocol, um, it just seemed to me that was a terrible mistake and, and, and uh, brought on by some, I would say, misguided ideology on the part of some of the, uh, the NGOs. Um, fortunately, forests are back on the, on the strategy table in Poznan right now, in Poland, in the, in the negotiations on the post-Kyoto agreement. Uh, and. Um, um, I, so anyway, I've been uh, interested in forests uh, in, in that context. In, in fact, in 1989, I testified before Senator Leahy um, that perhaps we should add uh, carbon management to one of the multiple uses for national forests. That sits in some, some record somewhere and went absolutely no place, um, which is probably not surprising given the time that it was put forward. Um, uh, but but that raises this larger uh, issue of um, of uh, what functions do uh, do forests actually play? And there's been, as you practitioners know, uh, a real evolution in that thinking over the years, uh, going from 
from basically getting logs to the mill gate um, and, uh, oh yes, we should do that sustainably, sustainable yield and so forth, going back to Gifford Pinchot, but, but uh, most other forest uses were subordinate to getting, getting uh, uh, boards and fiber out of, the, out of the forest. That was the main thing. Um, I was approached by um, some people in the Dutch government. I do a fair amount of work in Europe, and uh, uh, the, the, the Dutch had taken over as the um, chair of the UN Forum on Forests. And uh, there had been 15 years, literally 15 years, of unproductive uh, discussions and negotiation. Um, every year, what happened was about the same. The developing countries would come to that forest and say, well, if you want to save these forests, pay us. And the developed countries would say, no, we won't. And then they'd come back next year and say the same thing louder. And it just was going nowhere. And, um, and so the, 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 the Dutch um, chair, uh, whom I had met through some other work I've been doing in the Netherlands, uh, we were just having a conversation about it. And I, I, I said, well, you know, I, I quite frankly, I think I think we're on a, a misguided strategy the way we've been thinking, not only about forests but a lot of other things. Um, uh, trying to protect forests by putting a fence around it and keeping people out, when in fact a lot of people uh, use forests for livelihoods is is really not a very useful strategy. Um, telling people just not to emit greenhouse gases uh, instead of saying how do you develop sustainably seems to me we've been working on the wrong end of many of these problems. And so he said, well, one of the hang-ups is, 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 is funding, because funding means governments put up money. And basically, few governments want to put up any money to save any forest anywhere in the world. And so we started talking about it, and uh, he liked some of the ideas I put forward. And so I came back here, and we began this project. We, we, we put together um, uh, Professor Otto Najam and I, and uh, and two people from the from the Dutch uh, agricultural ministry uh, worked for the better part of a year uh, to develop a uh, what we now call a financing strategy as opposed to a funding strategy. Uh, funding is one piece of that, but it's no longer the total the total piece. Um, and and it, and just to summarize fairly quickly, the the idea the idea is um, we need to look at uh, Forests in all of their multiple roles, um, and ask not how do we protect forests, but rather how do forests contribute to sustainable development? And um, uh, since forests are uh, sources of uh, uh, food, fiber, um, uh, timber, and so forth, but they are also uh, they protect watersheds. Uh, they um, uh, they do store uh, carbon, twice as much carbon as in the, or at least twice as much carbon as in the soils and stems of, of, of forest um, as is in the atmosphere. Um, and and the cutting down and burning of forests is is contributing something in the neighborhood of 20 percent to the carbon dioxide going into the atmosphere. And um, so what we're seeing is a recognition by some of the developing countries who've been reluctant to take on uh, commitments to address climate uh, that they've got to realize, well, we do have forests. And um, that's something we could contribute. But uh, if we can't exploit those for immediate resource gains, can we uh, work out some way in which we get compensation for uh, protecting those forests, or for uh, agreeing to manage them in a, in a sustainably, you know, only sustainable harvesting, so that we're not uh, and we're careful about soil carbon and uh, issues of that sort. So, Bill, let, let me uh, jump in to ask. Um, I know that the the consensus is building towards a uh, cross-sectoral financing mechanism. And that, that the details of that financing mechanism are still being worked out. But can you talk about who some of the players are who are going to engage in putting that financing mechanism together? Right. Well, 
Last April 2007, there was a, a the, the seventh uh, conference of the parties of the UN Forestry Forum uh, adopted this plan that we had helped put together as the basis for future negotiations. And this coming April 2009, uh, they're supposed to finalize that. There have been a couple of uh, important international meetings in between. Um, but what's interesting is. Uh, with the announcement that this was the track that they were on, that they were looking for uh, engagement from the private sector, looking for engagement uh, from, um, I mean, something's dawned on people. You know, if, if the Gates Foundation can put out uh, you know, fifty million dollars uh, for for malaria in, in, in you know this week, and another fifty million for something else next week. That there there is this. Um, there are a number of these large foundations that are interested in protecting biodiversity. Well, biodiversity is another, if you like, ecosystem service that's provided by forests. And uh, and while forests are rooted in particular countries. Uh, the value of biodiversity uh, really accrues to us all, and so therefore we should all be investing in it in some sense. So trying to think of, of mechanisms for uh, for bringing that about. Um, the um, the um, uh, as as we as we began to identify more and more funding potential uh, financing sources, which are more in the nature of investments than in charitable donations. Uh, what has happened is um, um, governments have said, well, if there's going to be that kind of investment, we might be willing in a you know, public-private partnership sort of way uh, to put some money up to, um, uh, to, uh, that would actually go to Indonesia, let's say, or to Brazil um, in, in order to reduce the, uh, the amount of deforestation that's going there. Uh, and uh, we'd be investing in particular kinds of ecosystem services that we value. And so um, uh, the Norwegian government has already uh, 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 said that they will come up with some money. The Swedish government, I believe, has said they'll come up with some money. And uh, the World Bank has already uh, set up a, um, a, an office and uh, installed some staff in it uh, that is uh, working to uh, become the uh, dispenser of of these um, uh, finances. And so it, it's basically, it's not going to be just a centrally run thing. It's going to be as diffuse and diverse as, um, as forests themselves are. Um, the task is made somewhat easier. I mean, when you, when you look in, at, at where forests are in the world, you know, half the forests in the world are in five countries. Right? It's, it's uh, the Russian Federation, it's Canada, uh, Brazil, the United States, and China. Right? Those five countries are, are more than, uh, uh, than, than half. Um, and, and only 25 countries account for about 85% of forests. So it may not be that difficult to kind of set up some systems, because it's both developed and developing countries that have the forests that we're trying to protect um, uh, to, um, uh, to, make things, uh, to make things happen. Um, Bill, let, let me ask another question, I, and let me also promise the audience that as the as the details of this forest financing mechanism uh, become uh, hammered out by all the parties engaged, we will return to the subject, perhaps with Bill and another colleague, uh, to talk about exactly how this thing is going to work. But we've been trying to bring you information that's on the frontier of conservation finance. And we're certain right, right on the edge of that frontier right now. This is happening as we speak. I'll effectively meeting with my Dutch colleagues this all this weekend to, to uh, uh, hammer out some some, some next uh, next phases that they will then bring to the uh, international negotiations. But Bill, let, let, in that context, let me ask you: uh, once this uh, mechanism is worked out, what are your hopes for the strategic significance of such a multi-sectoral uh, international funding mechanism? Well, um, I, I say the, the hopes are that we would actually begin to um, shift the emphasis from um, from a lot of don'ts to some productive do's. But by that I mean, uh, instead of simply uh, put it, say, don't take down that forest, um, that we, um, uh, we 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 work out uh, some strategies for how uh, forests really contribute uh, to livelihoods and development. 
uh, and, um, and and we will still be protecting some areas because of their ecological value, but we will also be managing other areas uh, in, in more productive ways, and that's what's drawing the funding. Uh, it's now that financing is coming from a whole bunch of different sources that would uh, not want to, want to simply pay for cutting trees, they not necessarily are keen to pay for just protecting national parks. Uh, but they're interested in improving livelihoods of people and well-being of people. And so they're seeing this as, a, as an alternative way to uh, do social investment, I guess it might be called. Great. Great. Um, let, let me, uh, given that we've, uh, we've got a second guest, let me um, uh, ask you to hold your questions for Bill Muma uh, until after we talk to Don Hay, and then we will open it up uh, to, to the entire audience, which now includes 67 people, which is quite a nice group for this kind of activity. Uh, our, our next guest is familiar with a uh, on-the-ground experiment that's now uh, going on in the United States. Uh, it's uh, called the Wetlands uh, Initiative out of Chicago. Uh, and I had the pleasure of going and speaking to an audience of uh, Wetlands Initiative supporters in Chicago earlier this year, and I can tell you there's a huge amount of enthusiasm uh, for a, a fairly uh, large-scale experiment that Don is helping to oversee in the Illinois River Basin. So Don, uh, are you there? I am. I am. Can you tell us a little bit about, uh, just briefly, about your background and um, how you became passionate about uh, what you call nutrient farming? I'd be happy to, Tim. And thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to your audience today. My interest in financing environmental change started many years ago as a young engineer, a uh, student uh, of civil engineering. I worked for the Army Corps of Engineers in the Kansas River Basin and the upper uh, Missouri River Basin, measuring the, the effects, measuring the uh, resilience of levees and other flood control structures in those basins. I moved on after finishing a, a master's at Kansas University to work for a large engineering firm in Chicago that was proposing, and actually it has now been implemented, a very large urban flood control project costing billions of dollars and requiring millions of dollars of electrical energy to be applied uh, in the, the name of flood control. And after some time, a small group of friends and myself got together and said there had to be a better way. There had to be a, a more efficient, a more sustainable way to manage our floodwaters than through concrete, and steel, and electrical energy. And we began to take the, the issue back to its roots, that is the landscape. And we developed a small project on the Des Plaines River, which flows through parts of Chicago, looking at what wetlands could do to store floodwaters and how they might be used to replace the concrete and steel structures that we uh, currently use. From that experience came the, the notion, the idea, the realization that if you control the flow of streams, if you control the hydrology of runoff, you're not only going to control flooding and flood damage, but you're going to control water quality, biodiversity, and a number of other services. And at the heart of that control, we realize our wetlands. Now everything uh, Bill, Bill Muma has said about forest systems apply to wetland systems as well. They're wonderful carbon sinks. They uh, store floodwaters very efficiently. They provide for biodiversity in their own right and manage and can manage water quality. Well, when some of the results began to emerge from our uh, research projects, and we had uh, quite a, a stellar group of scientists working with us on some of the early uh, wetland restoration projects, we began to realize that these services, these ecosystem services, could have great value. They don't as, they, as wetlands now currently uh, lie on the landscape, but they could have great economic value. And so we began to 
try to raise money to restore wetlands. And after about 10 years of this effort, we realized that no amount of generous uh, giving by foundations or even no amount of, of programs, federal state programs, could restore the quantity of wetlands needed. For example, the 1993 flood, which caused $16 billion of flood damage, it would have taken, it would have taken about 13 million acres of wetlands to have held that water and avoided that damage. Restoring 13 million acres of wetlands is a large job. So what, and very expensive one, but much cheaper than the structural controls. So what we began to explore is a way to finance wetland restoration that in turn would pay for itself. And that's what's taken us, uh, Jim, to this, this notion of nutrient farming, growing wetlands on the floodplain where they once were rather than corn and soybeans, and having the landowner, the nutrient farmer, receive payment from those organizations, those agencies, those industries upstream that contribute too much runoff to the river, that contribute too much nitrogen, phosphorus, to the water or carbon to the atmosphere. Don, Don this is Jim Levitt. Uh, this, this might be a good time, uh, there we go, to go into uh, the slides that you've prepared to explain a little bit about how this particular effort is working on the Illinois River. Sure, I'd be delighted. The, the first principle, um, hang on a minute, we're getting, uh, we're getting organized here. <laughs> there we go. The first uh, issue is that we need to very clearly identify the problems that we face today and relate those problems back to the hydrology, to the landscape, and whether it's forest restoration, forest can help control the flow of water, the movement of water, or whether it's wetlands. And so we've looked at these seven uh, major problems, water pollution, flood damage, erosion, sedimentation, habitat destruction, global warming, waste heat, mercury methylation. Now that last one is sort of a specific uh, issue related to uh, water pollution and land pollution, but it is a, a, a issue that's going to have to be resolved before wetlands are broadly applied. And then we began to look at, at the, the logic behind the solution technology. And we break this logic down into this very simple syllogism. Land use controls the nature and distribution of development and its environmental impacts. Economics controls land use. Therefore, economics controls air, land, and water pollution. That syllogism embedded in our federal programs, our state programs, programs of private industry would, if embedded, would help solve the problem. The corollary solution is if economic controls our environmental problems, it can solve our problems. And that is a major step forward. What we have to include in that economic uh, paradigm is that there are no government subsidies and no external costs from developments on the floodplain. And that is a hard one. Around St. Louis today, they're building levees higher and higher. They're putting warehouses behind those levees. They are, they are actually increasing the potential flood damage that inevitably will occur. And when you look at uh, the past federal programs, and you look at uh, our, our past efforts to solve flooding, you notice a very peculiar relationship. Now take a look at the red line. The red line represents the, the uh, cost of, of, of losing, the external cost of developing floodplains. When you look at the, the dashed yellow line, that is the amount of money that we are spending on flood control and spending in terms of uh, levees and dams, concrete and steel solutions. And yet when you look at the dotted 
uh, line in there, the dotted green line, you notice that, that flood damages are continuing to grow. Now, it's very strange that the more we spend, the more flood damages increase. In fact, it's increasing more rapidly than our investment in solution. There is something inherently wrong with the solution that we're using. And we haven't been able to stop ourselves and turn around. We think the appropriate solution is the construction of wetlands on the floodplain. Now, let's take a look at another externalization of cost, because we've externalized the cost of development by allowing developers to simply push the water downstream. And whether by more efficient channels or levees, clearly it's had an adverse effect. When you look at the water quality of our streams, and this is the Illinois River downstream for Chicago, and we're looking at this uh, location about Peoria. This is about 100 years of record. And you look at the, the last decade of the 1800s as compared to the last decade of the 1900s, and you notice a huge increase in uh, nitrogen coming off of the watershed. And this would be leaving or flowing by Peoria, which is about in the middle position of the, uh, the basin. And not only do you see a huge increase in concentration, but you all see a change in timing, which is extremely important. In the January-March period, 100 years ago, the concentrations were at the lowest. And those are the loads that flow down to the Mississippi River and into the Gulf of Mexico. Suddenly now, 100 years later, we're putting four to five times the amount of nitrogen into the Gulf of Mexico. And it is in this period where hypoxia is set and where hypoxia occurs. So we've not only changed the, the quantity, but we've also changed the distribution. When you think of nutrient farming, you think of other competitive needs for the land, such as growing corn and soybeans. The needs for nutrient farming, however, would not substantially affect our ability to produce corn and soybeans. It simply moves the so corn and soybean production to areas that are ecologically uh, more sound, ecologically less damaging. So what would be the incentive for somebody to engage in nutrient farming? Well, we used a little model from Iowa State University to look at the profit made by a farmer in growing corn. And that's someplace around $90 uh, an acre. And then we looked at production of soybeans on that same acre, and that would be maybe a little over $100 an acre. When we started looking at the alternative price for nitrogen and phosphorus control, and these prices were established by an economic study done with the Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago uh, and ourselves with a grant from Worth Water and Environment Research Foundation, we found that the price that the Water Reclamation District would be willing to pay for a water quality credit was substantially higher and, and produced greater profits for the landowner and still saved the Water Reclamation District about 40% about of their cost to uh, construct and operate the alternative, which would be larger tanks, more aeration, uh, more pumping cost. When we take the nutrient farming revenue and look at the net profits, we get about $200 out of nitrogen, or maybe about another 150 from phosphorus, and then some carbon sequestration. That carbon bar up there is a, a little bit of a, uh, a bogus uh, value because we were using the current uh, market value for carbon that is being expressed in, in Europe. We think if there really were a serious carbon market, that, that bar uh, that element would be much larger. So when you stack the nutrient controls with flood storage and recreation, you see you can produce a substantial net profit for the landowner. And that's what we think will drive the market. If we can establish it, the market will be driven by these rather substantial prices that can be uh, obtained from the sale of credits. 
So what we would do, what we simply uh, propose, Jim, is to convert the corn and soybeans now grown on the floodplain. And this is a picture of a levee district southwest uh, of Chicago that we acquired. And in about two years after we restored the land, we stopped the pumping, we stopped growing crops, we had a fully functional wetland. And that wetland was very, uh, um, it, it very aggressively removed nitrogen from the water. Now, we don't nearly have the flow stream through this one as yet, but it's about 1,500 acres of pretty high quality uh, marsh. And uh, if you sort of ignore the negative impacts of the common carp, we've had uh, quite a success here. The potential market uh, in the Illinois uh, uh, Basin and the Mississippi Basin combined and just take 5 million acres of restored floodplain. Now that 5 million acres comes from the recent 2008 flood. We would have avoided all the flood damage there, which is around 6 to $8 uh, uh, billion. We would, have, we would have avoided all that damage if we'd had 500 million acres of restored wetlands. And the value of that would have been $2 billion. That's a pretty substantial market. So what we are about today is setting up a large-scale pilot project uh, on the Illinois River, which will help quantify the, if the uh, efficiency and the effectiveness of wetlands to remove nitrogen, phosphorus from the water, carbon from the air, and that it will be sustainable. We have to use uh, as little uh, fossil fuel to drive the process, and we will rely mostly on solar radiation, as wetlands do. And we're also looking at the issue of how to make nutrient farming fair so that the current landowners can stay in place, can convert from corn and soybeans, and grow wetland. Don, that, that uh, was a terrific presentation. We had about five people online while you were speaking asking, will your slides be made available? And uh, uh, I believe the answer is yes. Within the next couple of days, we'll be able to share those slides with the audience that's logged on now and with other people who come onto the website later. We'd be happy um, to buy them. Let me ask you, though, uh, and I know this because you and I have had previous conversations, uh, where are you getting the, the financing to do this large-scale experiment uh, on the Illinois River um, that's going to cover more than 1,000 acres? We have uh, support from uh, local foundations, uh, individuals. In fact, individuals have been as, uh, as interested and as aggressive as anyone in providing the funds. We've also had uh, support from the Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago. Now, they, um, they have been very supportive uh, institutionally, and we have yet to work out the uh, financial agreement as to what portion of the project they will pay. But they have uh, expressed a strong interest, as has their, their national uh, organization, which has endorsed the idea of nutrient farming. In the watershed, there are some 300 wastewater treatment plants. We have to remove over 100,000 tons of nitrogen per year to get the Illinois River back to the 1970 uh, levels, load levels, and it, which in turn would translate to, of course, much a smaller uh, hypoxic zone in the Gulf of Mexico. Don, uh, we have, we have uh, a slew of questions that I'm going to move to now. Uh, and usually we keep this uh, session to about an hour. But with the lineup of questions uh, th that we've got right now, we may extend this to 11.15 uh, or 11.30 Eastern time. And of course, all of you are uh, welcome to stay with us or drop out when you need to. We will uh, put the recording of this online. But let me. Uh, open with a uh, first question from Hillary Swain, which is, uh, hold on just a second. 
the bottom one, Jim. Resources for the future. Uh, Hillary is a colleague who, who works at the Archbold Research Station um, in Florida. And they have their own um, nutrient farming analog that they're trying to uh, get underway down there. And Hillary has a specific and quite a uh, lengthy question for you, Don. I will read it, uh, and you can answer whatever part of it you like. Question for Dr. Hay. Who do you see as other potential buyers of water-related environmental services? Utilities demand for water services is typically constrained, so the funding generated by this type of buyer may be limited. Who else is interested? Other private sector buyers? The United States Department of Agriculture? What is your guess about the potential share that these buyers might purchase in a scaled-up system? What would, who would be at the table? Let, let me stop uh, the question there, but uh, really, just to sum up, the question is, who else might be in this game? I think anyone that emits nitrogen, phosphorus to the water, carbon dioxide to the air, is a potential buyer. And that potential and the, the magnitude of that potential is going to be dependent on how costly it is to remove these constituents in a wetland environment or some other uh, landscape similar to a, a wetland. The cheaper the credits, the, the more uh, will be sell, uh, sold. What we have been looking at is the alternative pricing. A wastewater treatment plant, such as the Water Reclamation District, is going to have to spend an enormous amount of money to upgrade their plants in order to reduce the nitrogen and phosphorus to the now mandated federal uh, criteria. So what we've looked at is the alternative pricing. It would be much cheaper for the Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago to buy water quality credits. For example, they're going to have to spend $2.5 billion upgrading their plants we could provide them with the same water quality benefits for a savings of about $1.6 billion. That's $110 million a year net uh, profit, net savings. And if they split that with a landowner, the landowner's net profit would be about $50 million a year. So we have municipal wastewater treatment plants, industrial, uh, wastewater treatment plants in, in most of our urbanized uh, and industrialized sectors of the United States. Uh, there are literally thousands of these people out. Secondly, the power industry is a, a potential source of, uh, uh, I should say, a potential client for buying nutrient credits. Wetlands remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. Those carbon credits could be sold to them. Now, admittedly, we're nowhere near uh, solving their problem. We're going to have to do much more to get the carbon emissions down. Wetlands may handle, uh, just generally speaking, 10% uh, of the, the carbon uh, emissions that we need to reduce. On the, other, on the other side of it is the waste heat from power plants could be used by wetlands to help drive the biological processes, cooling the water at the same time producing carbon, nitrogen, phosphorus credits. So we have the, uh, the wastewater treatment uh, industry. I would like to absolutely exhaust uh, ourselves in the effort of finding places within our economy that, can, that, that need these credits and that will be willing to buy them and avoid going to, at least in the early stages, uh, large state federal programs. I think uh, if we can find the market, the real market, this will drive the size and the scale of our water quality credits. Don, thank you. Bill Moomaw wants to add a comment here. You know, it's, it's fascinating, Don. This is exactly the same thinking we've been having with, uh, uh, you know, the payment for ecosystem services by forests uh, and forest users and the users of those ecosystem services uh, and, and the recognition that the uh, uh, the, uh, the, these pieces of land uh, play multiple roles for multiple potential users. I mean, the, the current uh, uh, global uh, uh, market for carbon credits right now is about $3.5 billion. 
And that's only going to grow. I mean, right now, this very week, they're negotiating in Poznan, Poland, to figure out what to do. And carbon credits are going to be a big part of it. And as you're saying, some of those can be soaked up in wetlands. Some of that carbon dioxide can be soaked up by wetlands, and some of it can be soaked up by forests and the rebuilding of uh, carbon-depleted soils um, in, in forests and, uh, and in, um, as, as well as in agricultural soils. So that's, that's very much the strategy uh, that we had come to uh, idea with, with, with forests. I, I want to uh, interject to apologize to the audience. Uh, a colleague of mine walked in the room and reminded me what my children tell me every day, which is, Dad, your voice is so loud. <laughs> I, I think I've been talking a little too loud into the microphone, and so my apologies. <laughs> Don, I have a second question uh, for you from Sarah Lynch, who is a colleague of uh, Hillary Swain's, who is also working on this Florida Ranchlands Environmental Services Project. We have on your screen uh, a paper that Sarah wrote with Leonard Shadman, who is an resources for the future expert on these markets. Sarah asks, uh, Don, how are you documenting the nutrient reduction services provided by the wetlands? Please comment specifically on whether you are documenting practices on the services themselves. Have you made an estimate of how many acres of wetlands you would need to restore to make a difference, quote unquote, on downstream water quality? Well, we, we have. Um, in fact, there was a, uh, a paper published by the, um, let's see, I, I'm blanking on the name of the, uh, the publication, but it's uh, Restoration Ecology, in which um, I looked at what load reduction is necessary. Now, let's take it from another direction. We also made a, a pretty careful estimate of the amount of wetland restoration that would be needed to provide the Water Reclamation District of Greater Chicago with the nutrient reduction required of them under the pending state, uh, state rules. That number was around 200,000 acres of new wetland in the Mississippi Basin. Now, you think that's a pretty large number, and it is staggering. But when you look at the cost, the reaction of the Water Reclamation District when the results were put on the table, the reaction was, we'll simply go out and buy the land. Well, I think that violates one of our conditions, which is um, uh, fairness. I don't think it would be particularly fair if the Water Reclamation, Water Reclamation District went out and bought up all that land. So we have an idea of that. If we were looking to remove the 100,000 tons uh, per year, we would require about 500,000 uh, acres. That land is available within the basin. The floodplain of the Illinois River is about 400,000 acres. Half of that floodplain today, 200,000 acres, is behind levees, which of course aggravate flooding and flood damage and contribute to flood damage. So and we haven't even talked in the, in the past about the value of these wetlands for flood control. And that could be substantial. And the way we would argue there is that flood control would be an easement payment, and that might be a federal, state, or municipal program where the downstream municipality or the flood management agency such as FEMA would simply provide wetland um, developers, uh, wetland farmers, nutrient farmers, to provide flood storage on demand. So that's another, another source of uh, revenue for nutrient farming. Don, I just, I just want to add to that discussion that uh, we have been hearing on NPR and other places uh, the term green infrastructure uh, pop up again and again uh, with the uh, impending uh, uh, Obama administration. And uh, it's, it's hard sometimes to understand exactly what the commentators are talking about when they're talking about green infrastructure. I think that this is a very uh, specific example of how a federal investment in uh, a network of uh, green amenities and uh, places uh, could really make a difference in the, in the economy in the United States. All right, I have a question. Uh, Jim, may I, may I just respond to that for just a second? Please, yeah. Um, 
I like your, your attention on green. I think it is a bit misleading as it is now being used and discussed in Washington. It seems to me there are two classes of infrastructure in the United States. One is the built class, roads, levees, dams, and, and the like, wastewater treatment plants. That's built infrastructure. There is then the natural infrastructure, not green, because green could be a windmill. Green could be some sort of a sinuous uh, levee structure, but rather the natural infrastructure. And that infrastructure includes forest, it includes prairies, it includes wetlands, streams, rivers, and lakes. And that natural infrastructure is what we need to be spending a lot of time and effort and money on. And if the Obama administration wants to create um, jobs, I think the best place they could invest would be in the restoration of our natural infrastructure. Great. Um, I, I want to ask a question mostly directed, I think, at Bill Moomaw that comes from Kathleen Lawler at the Nicholas Institute for Environmental Policy Solutions at Duke University. And Kathleen asks the following. Presuming red, uh, which means, can you, can you Deconstruct red. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's to um, use uh, to reduce um, uh, deforestation and uh, degradation of forests uh, through um, uh, various means, and you get credit for that from a climate point of view. Okay, so presuming red is included in the next international climate change agreement, and or in a U.S. cap and trade policy, how would this forest financing mechanism? interact with market-based red mechanisms? Would the forest financing mechanism be an alternative, a fund-based mechanism for red? Or would it be more akin to the World Bank's forest carbon partnership facility, which aims to provide funding to build uh, a country's com capacity to enter red markets? I hope that made yeah. sense. No, it does make sense. I mean, essentially, the, the forest financing mechanism we've come in is, uh, we've come up with is comprehensive and interactive. And so uh, red is, it comes in under that, that rubric. In other words, um, uh, recognizing that, um, you know, paying for something other than uh, the logs coming out of the forest, in this case, uh, paying for the protection of, of existing forests, which is, which is an idea that, as I said, had been pretty much eliminated during the Kyoto negotiations, has now been brought back in by developing countries, um, uh, Papua New Guinea and Costa Rica in particular. And there are now some 30 or more um, uh, developing uh, forested countries who have, have uh, basically signed on to say, we like this idea, let's push it forward. Um, so so it's, not in a, it's not instead of, it's part of. And, and one of the things I didn't have a chance to really emphasize is that um, uh, what we found is, you know, public se sector funding alone doesn't, doesn't it, there just isn't enough to do what needs to be done. Um, uh, payment for ecosystem services is kind of in its infancy. Um, I mean, we did have some debt for nature swaps back in the 90s. Those seem to have kind of faded from the scene. And, and, and we learned some. Not all of them were successful, but we learned a lot from that process. Um, uh, engaging the private sector in, um, in, in the way in which they manage uh, commercial forests in more productive ways uh, could be part of this. Uh, and then mobilizing uh, the philanthropic leaders is, a, is another piece of it. So putting all of this together, civil society, individuals, uh, public sector, private sector, even on a particular, if you're going at a particular um, forest in a particular location, is more likely to raise the amount of uh, financing that's necessary to actually uh, produce a, um, a, um, a, 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 a strategy and a solution for uh, that particular forest. And um, so, it, so red is part of this, not, not separate from it. Uh, a follow-up question, Bill, from Robert Keller. Bill, it appears that most regional carbon registries and carbon initiatives in the United States have made recommendations not to give offset credit for avoided deforestation projects. In light of the new movement abroad to recognize avoided deforestation as a valid means of carbon sequestration, do you see the United States following suit? 
Oh, that's that's a really interesting question. I you know I'm always reluctant to predict uh, to make predictions, especially about the future, as Yogi Berra used to say. Uh, uh, I, I, I don't. I guess what we really need to do is get at the bottom of why there's the objection uh, to um, uh, forest protection uh, of existing forests and. Um, uh, I think one legitimate criticism is uh, without an overall cap, uh, all of these projects that are done are kind of open-ended. And you can just go, you know, if you, don't, if you don't cut down that forest and you get credit for it, you can just move over and cut down a different forest or, or burn it down or whatever you're going to do, clear it for, for agricultural purposes or whatever. So um, I think one of the things that might um, address the, some, at least the concerns I've heard about uh, using uh, avoided deforestation would be to put a, a true cap um, so that basically uh, it's not like just continually printing new money uh, that has, uh, you know, that, that, that or, or counterfeiting money in some cases, uh, but, but really would uh, have, have uh, real reductions and, and, um, and, and not just uh, protect one area relative to another. Great. All right, uh, Don, uh, clicking back to you, we have a question from Zachary O'Dell. And the question is, specifically who holds and manages the restored wetlands? And I will add the question, who will hold and manage those wetlands over time once the pilot has been proved? Once uh, this becomes an industrial process and landowners are converting from corn and soybeans to wetlands, if they have a large enough piece of land, they may enter into direct contract with the emitter. Let's, and let's use the wastewater, the municipal wastewater treatment plant as an example. The wastewater treatment plant has a permit from the US EPA and the state where they reside to discharge to the stream. That MPDS permit has a five-year cycle to it. So every five years, it has to be renewed. In order to meet the water quality demands, the nutrient demands of the state, federal government, they would have to show contracts with nutrient farmers that were capable of taking that extra nitrogen out. And there may be, there may be you know, a, uh, a safety factor of one and a half, uh, say to one, for every ton discharge you have to take one and a quarter ton out or one and a half tons out. But whatever it is, the landowner would hold the contract. And that would seemingly work for very large nutrient farmers. But most farms, for instance, in Illinois, are around maybe 100 to 200 acres in size. There would have to be literally hundreds of these nutrient farms, uh, and it would have to be aggregated. Now, there may be professional groups that would aggregate them. One of the um, uh, organizational structures that we have uh, been exploring is the creation of water quality districts much like drainage districts or levee districts. It would be a water quality district which would aggregate the bottomland nutrient farms, and that's where most nutrient farms would be, would be right along the river on the 100-year floodplain, and they would aggregate those into districts. And the district then, the uh, managers of which would be hired by the landowners, would then operate the nutrient farms, collect the data, and they have to be monitored just as we monitor our wastewater treatment plants. So you'd have to have a fairly um, well-trained, uh, educated group of people monitoring and managing these wetlands. They would then produce, uh, let's say, a daily report, which on a monthly basis would be shipped to the state regulatory agency. They would certify that they accomplished the task or didn't accomplish the task. And when they accomplish the task, they would be paid by the um, municipality. So the land would remain in current ownership. Perhaps there's also the opportunity for uh, investors to acquire the bottom land and develop large nutrient uh, farms which are independent of the current owners. But I would hope most of this, uh, most of these transactions would occur between the existing property owners and the, um, uh, the purchaser, purchasers of water quality credits. Um, Don, let, let me uh, reiterate for our audience that we are probably going to go just five or ten minutes 
uh, over our uh, regular one hour uh, period here because we've got a couple of questions lined up. Uh, for those of you who can stay with us, that's terrific. If you have to drop out, uh, the full presentation will be recorded uh, online. Uh, now, uh, Don, I have a question that's related from Robert McGuinn, and I'm going to just read part of his question because you've already answered part of it. Uh, and as the New York Times tells us um, this morning, uh, Illinois uh, is a place where uh, fraud does happen from time to time. Uh, <laughs> a mean question. So, uh, that wasn't a question. That was an editorial comment. Editorial comment. Uh, but the, the, the question is, what about the detection and prevention of fraud in the process? And my, my following question is, what kind of third party organization would be able to audit and verify um, the production of the credits uh, that uh, a wetland, a nutrient farming scheme would offer to be sold? It's, it's a good question. My uh, response to that has been all along, and to the listener, that the wastewater treatment industry in the United States today is self-regulated in large part. Uh -oh. State agents... Don, you've cut out. Um, are, you, are you still there? I'm still here. Yeah. Good. Can, can you hear me? I think that was, uh, this is Jim Cody. I think that was just actually our um, voice over IP phone, which sometimes does that for two or three seconds. Just to give us a scare, I think we're okay. Uh, All right. let's, let's start that answer again, please. All right. I, I think it is a good question, uh, and it's something that we've spent a, a great deal of time thinking about. Uh, what the listener has to understand is that the wastewater treatment industry in the United States is in large part self-regulated today. Their engineers and their registered engineers fill out the requisite forms and report those to the state. If they uh, don't report the correct information, they can be uh, taken to court for fraud and imprisoned. And it has happened a few times, not very many times. The state, uh, the regulatory uh, state agency would uh, be the, the organization that would review the uh, daily reports, the monthly reports that would go into the state, and from very, some, some very simple data, for instance, uh, climatic data, air temperatures, dew point, wind movement, they can uh, pretty well uh, determine whether or not the, the total tonnage of nitrogen and phosphorus carbon is actually being uh, secured, um, recycled, or sequestered. So they, that should be a pretty uh, easy task. It'll be a, a bit labor intensive, but then we're looking to create jobs today, right? I think that we need to have a very stringent monitoring program put in place that nutrient farmers must adhere to, and that we need also, as suggested, somebody going out and periodically taking uh, uh, companion samples and testing to make sure that the farmers are doing what they say they're doing. There's, a, there's an underlying, another uh, issue which has been discussed, and I don't have an answer for it right now, but the water reclamation districts would like to pass the liability of their NPDES permit in regards to nutrients to the nutrient farmer. The US EPA has been saying no way the, the permit holder must be responsible. They, in turn, are responsible for their provider of water quality credits to make sure that they are doing what they say they're doing. So we have here another way of checking, and that would be the, the contract uh, holder would periodically uh, make inspections of their nutrient farms, of nutrient farms that they're buying credit from. This issue of uh, corruption is, is a huge one for uh, forests uh, worldwide as well. Uh, back in the 90s, there was an analysis done that showed that um, uh, uh, Japan was importing twice as many logs from the Philippines as the Philippines was sending to Japan, so, <laughs> which is uh, they discovered some way to reproduce on the way across the Pacific or something. But anyway, it was, uh, it, was, it, was, it was clear that basically this was illegal logging that was uh, being, being shipped. It's estimated that the United States imports uh, somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of our imports are probably illegally harvested. Uh, somewhere in the world. What is absolutely astounding to me is there's now only one country in the world in which it is a crime to import illegal logs. It happens to be the United States. 
And that law has only been in effect since we passed the Agriculture Act last uh, spring, last whenever it was, June or whenever it was, the Farm Bill. Uh, the farm bill. Uh, and and uh, what it was was an amendment to the Lacey Act, which makes it a crime to uh, import illegal, uh, illegally taken um, wildlife. And for the first time, this now applies to uh, forest products. Uh, I, I think that's just an out, it's an outrage uh, that, uh, that, the, that the, uh, the governments of the world have been so irresponsible, mostly North America, Europe, and Japan, that we uh, have, have basically allowed this. And of course, everybody gets nervous when we start messing around with trade, but I think we've got to mess around with trade if we're going to deal with, uh, with uh, I mean, after all, uh, uh, timber and pulp and paper now are, are very much international commodities. And if we're going to um, do anything to maintain our forests, we've got to get a grip on the, uh, the illegal harvesting. And uh, the, the, the WTO has to face up to the fact that there is illegal trade. And that has to be somehow um, uh, discouraged and, and uh, reduced as much as possible. I just want to add to that that if my memory serves me correctly, the Lacey Act uh, was, was passed in the early 1900s. Yep. And, uh, was uh, an initiative that I believe Massachusetts Audubon uh, began to push for, and Teddy Roosevelt was a very strong proponent of. Right. Uh, and in the last election, uh, Theodore Roosevelt's name was invoked by both parties over and over again as the kind of leader we need in the 21st century, uh, particularly following through on your particular recommendation. Uh, across international borders might be a very good place to start. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm going to conclude this with uh, two more questions that we have lined up, uh, and then thank our guests for a very, very interesting session. Uh, this question comes from Robert Keller for both Bill and Don. He asks, recently the Environmental Protection Agency in the United States has begun an outreach program to enlist the land trust community in the long-term stewardship and monitoring responsibilities for wetland mitigation banks. Do you see a similar, similar role for the land trust community in the stewardship and monitoring responsibilities for sequestered carbon? Uh, Bill, let me ask you to begin, and then Don, we can get your response. Okay. Well, I, I think that's, that's, that's a very good observation. I, I mean, the, the, as we know, the local land trust movement is uh, uh, just uh, is, is grown enormously in, in the past couple of decades. and. Um, uh, the great thing about it is it's it's very local, and, and it, it for the most part, and it's uh, it's picking up things that will not be picked up by national governments or even state governments, and so even even uh, going after relatively small wetlands or very small uh, but important uh, pieces of forest um, for carbon storage. Uh, uh, could be in the mission uh, of uh, land trusts. I, I actually have been asked to speak on climate change to a couple of land trusts uh, just in the last uh, year or two for the first time. Nobody ever asked before. So I think it is beginning to be on the radar screen of, of at least some forward-looking leaders of land trusts. And uh, then they have to, of course, convince their members that this should be one of the functions uh, of and the and the, um, uh, the goals and missions of uh, of land trusts because it certainly hasn't been in the past. Don, what are, what are your thoughts on the role of land trusts and other uh, civic sector organizations in uh, monitoring specifically and more generally in helping to propagate these ideas far and wide? Well, I think it's a, a nice idea. I'm not so sure that they are well uh, uh, suited for the task. In terms of water quality credits, it's a highly technical field. Uh, there will be issues of custody of samples, where you take samples, how you take them. Uh, it will take a, a considerable, considerable amount of, of lab work to monitor it. And that's why I think the regulatory agencies, the state agencies, the Illinois Environmental Protection Agency, the, uh, you know, the Minnesota uh, Pollution Control Agency, they are much better equipped at this point to do that job. Monitoring as to whether or not the wetland exists, that's a fairly straightforward process. There are a lot of people who will take the stewardship of uh, conservation easements. And I think uh, in that realm, uh, it would be um, certainly a suitable task for these people. But on the other hand, I think uh, we would have to see a change in these organizations technically and professionally to be able to come to grips with the, the technical issues. 
All right. Now I, I will conclude with a last question from Story Clark, who writes in from the uh, great metropolis of Wilson, Wyoming. And uh, I, I want to take this question both specifically and more generally. Uh, the specific question is, what practically stands in the way of implementing the nu nutrient farming concept, and how can we make this concept a reality? So this is a question being asked by someone on the other end of the uh, Mississippi uh, watershed from you, Don. And, and the larger question uh, for Bill as well is, uh, what, what practically stands in the way from ecosystem service markets uh, from uh, having successful pilots and then becoming replicated uh, across the United States and conceivably worldwide? So Tom, let me let you take the swing at that, uh, the first swing at this last question, and then we'll turn it over to Bill. You, you, you've used the right words, Jim. Swing. We need a big club over the heads of our our industry, our municipal wastewater treatment industry, to put a water quality market in place. We need the nutrient criteria promulgated by the US EPA, codified in state rules and regulations. And once that happens, then I think you're going to see a very rapid development of this market, providing we are able to produce water quality credits uh, consistently and reliably, and can produce them for less cost than the alternative concrete and steel. And that's why we need pilot projects. Uh, and so I would guess that such a market could well be in place in the next four or five years. Great. Uh, Bill, yeah, I think uh, one of the uh, really important things for uh, from the forest point of view is uh, some kind of third party certification that, in fact, all these these uh, goals are being met. Uh, I agree with Don. I mean, as things get more technical, it's harder and harder for civil society organizations to cope with it. But it's also difficult for private sector, uh, whether that's farmers or, or forest landowners, to uh, uh, deal with this as well. I mean, the, the, that level of technicality is not been part of, of, uh, of their portfolio, and, and so they, they need some assistance. So I think government has, to, has a role to play both in setting up the, um, the rules uh, and making the rules uh, uh, not so horrendously complex. I mean, I, I would opt for uh, simplicity and close enough to exact uh, but too complicated to implement as, as, a, as a policy strategy. Uh, but uh, if you just look at what's happened um, with, uh, say, the Forest Stewardship Council, uh, which certifies uh, the, that uh, lumber is produced from sustainably managed forests, uh, three years ago when I began building a house, I, I, I was going to have to um, import a load from uh, Potlatch in Idaho to get the, uh, the, the material. I can now get it from my local lumber yard. Uh, so it's, it just dramatically changed things by having a, 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 an, a, an independent uh, third party that can uh, certify that these things are actually happening. And, and then the other piece I just want to repeat is uh, we, we need to really take a close look at some of our our, our laws, our regulations, our tax laws, and so forth, uh, some of which actively discourage both what Don is doing and what we're trying to do. I mean, if you, if you really get into this, uh, there, there are all kinds of, of regulatory and, and policy barriers. So uh, moving, moving those out of the way and, uh, and reframing them into uh, in, in, to encourage positive actions uh, is, is something else that we just can't take for granted. We're going to have to actively make the changes. Well, with that, I want to uh, thank uh, Bill Muma and Don Hay for a very interesting and stimulating conversation on eco services, ecosystem services. I will uh, term this uh, particular session as Ecosystem Services 1 and promise to come back with an Ecosystem Services 2 session uh, particularly when the forest financing mechanism is in place and we can talk about some specifics there. Uh, I want to thank the audience for tuning in and staying with us uh, for an hour and 15 minutes. Um, and uh, I have my ears open to innovative ideas from wherever they might come in the United States or internationally. Uh, thank you all very much. We will talk to you soon. <laughs>